Now this is the Paul who has rewritten the life of Jesus Christ. If we want to look at the origins of Christianity, to a great extent we have to look at uh, Paul of Tarsus yeah. as, as the person who originated Christianity. what is mainly considered Christian today owes uh, a lot to St. Paul and these three, I, these three areas of inquiry in fact can be credited uh, very squarely uh, to uh, the emphasis that St. Paul has left uh, concerning these three areas in his writings. Many Muslim critics assert that the Apostle Paul was not a true Apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. They erroneously argue that Paul came in after the real Apostles and took over the scene corrupting Christianity. Many Muslims assert that the original message of Jesus and his true followers, their supposed Islamic teaching, was in complete disagreement with Paul's new theology. In contrast to this modern Islamic view, the Christian position is that history demonstrates Paul was truly converted to Christianity. Christians argue that the evidence shows he was accepted by the original apostles and by the earliest Christians as a genuine convert with sound theology who was given an important mission from Christ himself. In this presentation, I will weigh the evidence that both sides offer. When investigating historical issues, it is important to use a reliable method to come to truth. I will be appealing to what is known as the historical method, as I argue that there are many strong reasons to affirm Paul's apostleship, and no strong reasons to deny Paul's apostleship. I will utilize historical principles, including the concept of multiple independent attestation, early accounts, i.e. the oldest source material, eyewitness testimony, disinterested comments in the criterion of embarrassment. It is also important to speak to the lack of early reliable evidence for the modern Muslim view concerning Paul. Lastly, I will demonstrate that the modern Islamic polemic against Paul is not consistent with many early Muslim traditions which affirm that Paul was in fact viewed as a true apostle. Positive historical case for Paul's apostleship when historians use the historical method, they will consult the earliest sources regarding the historical issue in question. The earliest sources pertaining to Paul are the first century documents that were canonized into the Bible in the fourth century. The Bible is not one source. It is a compiled collection of many separate documents written over a span of about 1,400 years. The first century texts that were canonized into the New Testament have much to say concerning the Apostle Paul and are thus very important to our study. Some Muslims may object and assert that one cannot use the Bible to prove Paul. However, such a surface level objection is based on ignorance since, again, the New Testament is a collection of valuable early historical documents, many of which speak directly to this issue. To discard the first century documents that are in the Bible and not include them in our study would be to neglect the earliest sources we have concerning this issue. That method would essentially be to irresponsibly throw away important data, which no serious historian or researcher would ever do. If historical sources don't count, then we can't know anything about history. First Century Biblical Sources With respect to the first century biblical evidence concerning Paul, we have Paul's writings, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus and Philemon. The history of the 1st century church, known as Acts or Acts of the Apostles, 
and a Christian epistle known as 2 Peter. So, with respect to the first century biblical writings, we have Paul's epistles, as well as two other independent documents to work with. All of the first century biblical sources that mention Paul affirm that Paul was a genuine apostle. None of them question that. All throughout the book of Acts, we see Paul identified as a true apostle, and so we could quote numerous passages affirming this from Acts. However, one striking feature is that in the Acts 15 Jerusalem Council, Paul played a leading role with the other apostles such as James and Peter in answering the question about Gentiles being under the law. As the council was in session, we see the following. And all the assembly fell silent. They listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles." Unquote. Acts 15, 12. Paul and Barnabas spoke after Peter, who spoke from verses 7 to 11, and right before James, who spoke from verses 13 to 21. James concluding the council and giving the final decision that the Gentiles are not under the law. This demonstrates that there was first century recognition of Paul's acceptance by the early church and by the apostles themselves as an authoritative voice. The book Second Peter is rejected by many liberal scholars and Muslims, but there is a strong case for its authority and for Petrine authorship. It is important to note that Second Peter itself is not an unnamed work. In chapter 1 verse 1 it states, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ." Unquote. Therefore, when early Christians alluded to it or quoted it as an authoritative text, they are giving implicit recognition of its Petrine authorship, which it claims for itself. Many hold that the extremely early first century extra-biblical document known as the Letter to the Corinthians, written by Clement of Rome, alludes to 2 Peter 2.5. The Letter to the Corinthians, chapter 7 states, Noah preached repentance, and as many as listened to him were saved." Unquote. This seems to be an allusion to 2 Peter 2.5 which states, "...and spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly." Unquote. This demonstrates that those in the first century Church of Rome, like Clement, believed 2 Peter to be authoritative and petrine. Another extra-biblical Christian text from 100 AD, known as the Epistle of Barnabas in chapter 15 states, quote, This implies that the Lord will finish all things in 6,000 years, for a day is with him a thousand years, unquote. This is a quotation from 2 Peter 3, 8, which states, With the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day, unquote. This shows that the Christian author of the Epistle of Barnabas held 2 Peter to be authoritative and petrine, Examples of patristic writings quoting 2 Peter include Irenaeus' quotation of 2 Peter 3.8 in his work Against Heresies, Book 5, Chapter 28. The 2nd and 3rd century church father Clement of Alexandria seems to allude to 2 Peter 2.5 in his work The Stromata, Book 1, Chapter 21. The 3rd century church father Cyprian quotes 2 Peter 2.11-12 2, in his work Treatise of Cyprian, Treatise 12, Chapter 11, and calls this work the quote-unquote Epistle of Peter. This shows that Cyprian and those around him viewed 2 Peter as Petrine. Papyrus 72 or P72 is a 3rd to 4th century Greek manuscript which was found in Egypt and it contains sections of 2 Peter, demonstrating that these early Christians regarded 2 Peter as canonical, authentic, and Petrine. The Coptic Sahidic translation of the Bible contains 2 Peter. Scholars like Dr. Horner and Dr. Hornack state that the Coptic Sahidic translation of the Bible is 2nd century. This again shows that early tradition has it so that 2 Peter was authoritative and authentic among many early Christians. The Apocalypse of Peter is a 2nd century extra-biblical Christian apocalyptic work, which drew from 2 Peter, demonstrating that the author believed 2 Peter to be authoritative and possibly Petrine. This text, 2 Peter, is another 1st century source that not only affirms that Paul was a true apostle, but it also identifies Paul's writings as scripture, quote, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters, when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures." Unquote. Second Peter 3, 15-16.
the best case scenario is that Peter wrote this and is accepting Paul. I believe this is the case. The worst case scenario is that this is another independent first century attestation affirming the reliability of Paul, which we can add to the list. Even if it were not from Peter, it is still an early attestation which was accepted by the early church and even added to the canon of scripture. Historians look for the earliest first century writings when it comes to Jesus and early Christianity. That there are no first century writings asserting that Paul was a false apostle discredits the Muslim position severely. The historical principle of early sources and multiple independent attestation is thus met with respect to first century biblical evidence for Paul. If Paul was a true apostle, we would expect his own letters to confirm that this was so. It must be asked, is there anything in Paul's writings that historians would accept as proving that he was genuine? There are many things to consider. For example, it is important to consider the principle of embarrassment, which is the principle that something or someone is more likely to be authentic if there are embarrassing themes that you wouldn't expect to be openly talked about. We see that Paul was quite open about his shortcomings, disputes with other apostles, and his flaws. Such things persuade historians of Paul's integrity and honesty, and thus his claims to apostleship gain credibility. Paul was open about his humanity and imperfection. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Philippians 3, 8-12 And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and injurious. But I obtained mercy, because I did it ignorantly, in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 16. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 2 Corinthians 12, 7-9 This information meets the principle of embarrassment which historians look for. Christ and the apostles had a very high view of holiness and sanctification, and so therefore we wouldn't expect Paul to admit his imperfection and need for grace if he was an imposter trying to usurp or lead people away from the moral teachers Jesus and the apostles. It is a human tendency to want to appear morally good in religious settings. This is especially true of those times Although Paul was a sanctified model for morality and exhorted others to be moral, he was honest in admitting that he, like everyone else except Christ, was not perfect, and that he, like everyone else, relied on God's grace in his life. We know from history that later untrustworthy people who claimed to follow Christ, such as Pelagius, dishonestly claimed to be completely morally perfect. One would naturally expect something like this from Paul, if he was trying to usurp Jesus and the apostles who taught holiness and sanctification. But Paul, being genuine, admitted his imperfection, as did the other prophets and apostles either explicitly or implicitly in scripture, and taught that one ought to strive for holiness in light of being imperfect. In being honest about his imperfection and his reliance on God's grace, Paul was doing the right thing, according to Jesus' teaching on salvation. Hence, this kind of material demonstrates that Paul was genuine, since if he was not, 
there would be no reason to include these types of admissions in his epistles, admissions that critics may twist or use against Paul. Paul recorded his rebuke of Peter. One thing you would not want to do if all you were was a false apostle pretending to be a true apostle is invent a story where you rebuke a major influential apostle in front of others for not handling the gospel accurately. However, this actually happened. Paul did just that to the Apostle Peter, demonstrating that Paul genuinely cared about the Gospel and would not compromise it for anyone, including major apostles he worked with who stepped out of line. Quote, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party and the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified." Unquote. Galatians 2, 11 to 16. Peter learned from this mistake and would go on to grow in grace, remain close with Paul, and eventually die as a martyr in Rome, where Paul was also martyred, proving that Peter was a genuine appointed leader of the early church. Jesus himself taught, that Peter would die a faithful man following God in John 21, 18 to 19, which demonstrates that Peter learned from his mistake with Paul in Galatians 2, 11 to 14, and was put back on the path of righteousness for the remainder of his life, quote, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me, unquote. John 21, 18 to 19. Moreover, there is early extra biblical material which mentions Peter and Paul simultaneously teaching the Christians in Rome. This proves that Peter and Paul reconciled their past differences, the Galatians 2, 11 to 14 dispute. This is evidenced in the document known as the Letter to the Romans written by Ignatius of Antioch, who was a pupil of the apostles, quote, I do not command you, as Peter and Paul did, unquote. Moreover, the second century church writer Irenaeus reports an ancient tradition about Peter and Paul's time in Rome together, demonstrating that they remained close despite their conflict in Galatians 2, 11 to 14. Irenaeus states, by pointing out here the successions of the bishops of the greatest and most ancient church known to all, founded and organized at Rome by two most glorious apostles, Peter and Paul. That church, which has the tradition of the faith, which comes down to us after having been announced to men by the apostles." Unquote. Their martyrdoms in Rome are documented by Clement's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5, quote, Let us set before our eyes the illustrious apostles, Peter, through unrighteous envy, endured not one or two, but numerous labors, and when he had at length suffered martyrdom, departed to the place of glory due to him, owing to envy Paul also obtained the reward of patient endurance, after being seven times thrown into captivity, compelled to flee, and stoned, after preaching both in the east and the west. He gained the illustrious reputation due to his faith, having taught righteousness in the whole world, and come to the extreme limit of the west and suffered martyrdom under the prefects. Thus he was removed from the world, and went into the holy place, having proved himself a striking example of patience." Unquote. This evidence serves as weighty proof for the fact that despite Peter and Paul's dispute in Galatians 2, 11-14, they remained close friends and fellow apostles in life. This information tells us a lot about the integrity and reliability of Paul. One would not expect Paul to report that he publicly rebuked a fellow worker and major apostle if in fact he was some usurper trying to fit in. You would expect him to want to avoid any unnecessary controversies or quarrels. This also meets the principle of embarrassment.
disinterested comment about James. We can know Paul was a reliable true apostle because of his disinterested comment about the apostle James in Galatians 1.19 which states, Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him for fifteen days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother." Unquote. Notice the disinterested off-the-cuff remark from Paul about James. The point is, if Paul was a false apostle inventing stories, we wouldn't expect him to just mention James in passing without making a point. The fact that Paul merely mentions James in this off-the-cuff way persuades historians that Paul is trustworthy, showing that he wasn't out to merely prove he was an apostle with fanciful detailed stories, but that he was actually recalling real events about his association with the early church. Paul's Gospel in the 1 Corinthians 15 Apostles' Creed is the original Gospel. We can know Paul was a genuine apostle preaching the original Gospel because his 1 Corinthians 15 Creed, which he received very early from the Apostles Peter and James, is dated very closely to the time of Jesus' crucifixion by scholarship, which shows that Paul's message was not some later innovation. The Creed states, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. 1 Corinthians 15, 3-8 Here Paul reminds the Corinthian church that this gospel message, or creed, which he previously preached to them orally, was first given to him. It is important to note that Paul mentions that he received this creed before giving it to them. The first century evidence demonstrates that Paul received this creed from Peter and James around AD 35 in Jerusalem. This demonstrates that Paul's gospel, Jesus' sacrifice for sins, the resurrection and appearances, was not some later corruption, but that it goes right back to the beginning, coming from the original apostles who walked with Christ. I will demonstrate this by constructing a timeline based on the early data. First, scholars put Jesus' crucifixion at about AD 30. After surveying the historical literature, Dr. Ben Witherington III affirms, quote, It makes sense to conclude that Jesus died on Nisan 14, April 7th, in AD 30, unquote. In his work on the resurrection, Dr. Mike Lacona notes that 30 AD, is the standard dating of Jesus' death among scholars. With that said, Paul's conversion to Christianity is dated one to two years after Jesus' death by scholars. Dr. Craig L. Blomberg puts Paul's conversion at 32 AD, two years after Jesus' death. One of the leading scholars on this subject is Dr. Gary Habermas, and he notes that scholars usually place Paul's conversion one to two years after the cross and goes with AD 32. He states, Paul's conversion is usually placed one or two years later, so let's just say two, that's 32 AD." Unquote. The first century documentation shows that after Paul's conversion around AD 32, he then went to Arabia and after three years he went to Jerusalem to see Peter and James. Galatians 1, 15 and 19 states, But when he who had set me apart before I was born, and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me, in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother." Unquote. With respect to this material, Dr. Howard Clark Key notes that it, quote, can be critically examined, just as one would evaluate evidence in a modern court or academic setting, unquote. Therefore, when one does so, you can see that the information harmonizes into a consistent stream, in that you are left with a clear picture about where this creed comes from. Galatians 1, 15-19 shows that in AD 32, Paul was in Arabia for three years until AD 35, and then he went to Jerusalem. Paul went to Jerusalem in AD 35 to meet with Peter and James five years after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. 
In Galatians 1.18, it says something extremely noteworthy with respect to Paul's 15-day Jerusalem stay in AD 35. It says, quote, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, Peter, and remained with him for 15 days, unquote. The word for visit there is actually a bad translation. The Greek word there is historio, where we get our English word history. According to the standard lexical work of today, the Bauer Arndt Gingrich Danker Greek English Lexicon, page 483, the Greek word historio means to get information from. It means to gain an account. Therefore, this first century data shows that in AD 35, Paul met with Peter in Jerusalem to inquire about the gospel or gain a historical account of the gospel and confirm that what he had previously received from the Lord through Revelation in Galatians 1, 11 to 12 was the true account of the gospel preached by the apostles. That at this time Paul received the 1 Corinthians 15 creed from Peter and James is the position of the majority of scholars. The creed, which talks about Jesus dying for our sins and rising from the dead. In the verses just preceding the actual creed in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 3, we see technical rabbinic terms denoting the passing of previously received oral tradition, which many scholars argue is in reference to Peter transmitting this creed to Paul in AD 35. Words like delivered or handed on, paradidomai, and received, paralambano, in reference to Paul receiving this creed from Peter and James in Jerusalem. It makes perfectly logical sense, along with the fact that Paul says he went to gain a historical account from Peter, that in his 15 days in Jerusalem with Peter and James, he received, paralambano, this creed. It is illogical to think that Paul would not be discussing such important issues with Peter and James after his dramatic experiences. Of course, Paul would want to confirm the gospel with Peter and James, gaining a historical account of the gospel from them, to see if it lined up with what he had previously come to believe in the three years prior. This, I feel, along with the majority of scholars who have written on the subject, is the best explanation among a few as to where Paul got his transmitted 1 Corinthians 15 creed. If Paul received this creed from Peter in AD 35, then Paul's gospel is traced right back to the beginning. This would mean that Paul's message is not some later innovation or novelty, but is instead traced back to those who walked and talked with Jesus, the apostles. This utterly refutes the modern Muslim claim that Paul came in later and corrupted Christianity with a new gospel. Moreover, there is absolutely no first century evidence questioning this event with Peter and James, or casting doubt on it. Scholars have much to say concerning this creed, its reliability, and its date in light of Paul receiving it very early. The British biblical scholar Michael Goulder states that the creed, quote, goes back at least to what Paul taught when he was converted, a couple of years after the crucifixion, unquote. Professor Yilrick Wilkins states that this material, quote, undoubtedly goes back to the oldest phase of all in the history of primitive Christianity, unquote. The scholar Walter Casper contends that this creed was circulating by the end of 30 AD. The notable atheist New Testament critic Gert Ludemann states, quote, the elements in the tradition are to be dated to the first two years after the crucifixion, not later than three years after the death of Jesus, unquote. Liberal scholar James D.G. Dunn states, This tradition, we can be entirely confident, was formulated as a tradition within months of Jesus' death, unquote. Gerd Thaysen and Annette Mertz state, quote, The analysis of the formula tradition about the resurrection of Jesus allows the following conclusion. A tradition in 1 Corinthians 15, 3b-5, which goes back very close to the events themselves, attests appearances to both individuals and groups, the credibility of this tradition is enhanced because it is in part confirmed by the narrative tradition, which is independent, and because in the case of Paul, we have the personal testimony of an eyewitness who knew many of the other witnesses." Unquote. Reginald Fuller states, quote, It is almost universally agreed today that Paul is here citing tradition. Unquote. The eminent scholar F.F. F. Bruce also argues that Paul received this creed from Peter and James in AD 35 in Jerusalem, quote, In the list, two individuals are mentioned by name as having seen the risen Christ, and two only. He appeared to Cephas, and he appeared to James, 1 Corinthians 15, 5 and 7. It is no mere coincidence that there should be the only two apostles whom Paul claims to have seen during his first visit to Jerusalem after his conversion in Galatians 1:19. It is almost certainly during these 15 days in Jerusalem that Paul received this outline, unquote.
In his 1999 work, The Acts of Jesus, The Search for the Authentic Deeds of Jesus, page 466, the radical liberal Jesus Seminar co-founder, Dr. Robert Funk, states that the 1 Corinthians 15 Creed was formulated within, quote, two or three years at the most, unquote. Two or three years after Jesus' crucifixion, that is. Therefore, scholarship is quite clear on the 1 Corinthians 15 Creed being extremely early tradition formulated close to the time of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. This utterly refutes the concept of Pauline Christianity and demonstrates that Paul's gospel and theology, Jesus dying for sins and rising from the dead, is the original, early, apostolic gospel according to the first century data. The original apostles confirmed Paul's gospel and apostleship. The first century historical documentation on this issue also shows that 14 years after the Jerusalem affair with Peter and James in Galatians 1 15 and 19, Paul then went back to Jerusalem again with Barnabas and Titus. According to the first century data, Paul says the pillars of the church, James, Peter, and John, quote, added nothing to me, unquote, Galatians 2 6. This means that the original apostles of Jesus Christ added no correction to Paul's gospel message which he was preaching after the Jerusalem affair in AD 35. Hence, the original apostles affirmed what Paul was preaching, namely Jesus' crucifixion as a sacrifice for sins and his resurrection as orthodox theology. Moreover, James, Peter, and John all extended their right hand of fellowship to Paul after seeing Paul's grace, Galatians 2.9. This extremely early data, AD 49-54, is a severe blow to the anti-Pauline crowd since it adds one more attestation to the conclusive first century case for Paul's reliability and apostleship. It must be stressed over and over because it is important that there is no clear first century documentation to the contrary, asserting that Paul was not a true apostle who was close to the original apostles or that he had a false message. With respect to scholarship's view on this issue, the secular historian William Durant states, quote, no one has questioned the existence of Paul or his repeated meetings with Peter, James, and John, and Paul enviously admits that these men had known Christ in the flesh." Unquote. Early Extra-Biblical Sources Affirming Paul's Apostleship Now that we have covered some of the biblical data that validates Paul's apostleship, I want to consider the early historical evidence outside of the Bible which affirms Paul as a genuine apostle. An important and often overlooked consideration to observe in this study has to do with expectations. If Paul was in fact genuine, as I contend, we would expect to find extremely early church writers affirming the apostleship of Paul as well as quoting his epistles as being authoritative on the same level as scripture or directly as scripture. This is precisely what we find as the evidence is examined. If Paul was not a true apostle, then we would not expect to find numerous instances of the earliest extra-biblical writers who were often students of the original apostles affirming Paul's apostleship and viewing his writings as scripture. If Paul was not a true apostle, but was instead a false usurper as the Muslims claim, we would expect at least some evidence from the first century followers of Jesus and the apostles to state their case in opposition to Paul relegating him to the status of imposter. However, the earliest evidence is conclusive in affirming Paul's reliability. Ignatius of Antioch Ignatius of Antioch was a first century pupil of the original apostles. In the early document known as the Martyrdom of Ignatius chapter 1 we read, quote, Ignatius, the disciple of John the Apostle, a man in all respects of an apostolic character, governed the church of the Antiochians with great care. Unquote. The 3rd to 4th century church historian Eusebius states that Ignatius was the second bishop of Antioch after the apostle Peter, Evodius preceding him, which shows that Ignatius was in very close proximity to the apostles. Eusebius states, At this time Ignatius was known as the second bishop of Antioch, Evodius having been the first. Simeon likewise was at that time the second ruler of the church of Jerusalem, the brother of our Savior having been the first. Unquote and, quote, Ignatius, who was chosen Bishop of Antioch, second in succession to Peter, unquote. The 4th to 5th century Christian Theodoret also states, quote, You have no doubt heard of the illustrious Ignatius, 
who received the Episcopal grace by the hand of the great Peter, and after ruling the Church of Antioch, wore the crown of martyrdom." Unquote. This is important because if Paul was a false teacher and usurper, Ignatius, being a follower of the apostles and their gospel, he often quoted the gospels of Matthew and John as well, would have pointed out Paul's supposed theological errors or commented on Paul being a supposed false apostle. However, this first century martyr bishop offers early data in support of Paul's association with the other apostles, as well as Paul's rightful authority in the church. Ignatius wrote the following in AD 110 to the Christians in Rome, quote, I do not command you as Peter and Paul did, unquote. This extremely early material is affirming that Paul worked alongside Peter in leading and commanding the Christian church in Rome. Ignatius has other valuable remarks affirming the reliability of Paul. For example, in writing to the Christians in Ephesus, Ignatius relays that Paul accurately gave the gospel to the Ephesians, that Paul was martyred for his faith, which also shows Paul's reliability, as well as his deep respect and honor for Paul. Quote, you are initiated into the mysteries of the gospel with Paul, the holy, the martyred, the deservedly most happy, at whose feet may I be found, when I shall attain to God, who in all his epistles makes mention of you in Christ Jesus." Unquote. Ignatius often quotes Paul's epistles as authoritative writings, thus demonstrating that Paul was viewed positively in the earliest strand of first century Christianity. For example, in Ignatius's letter to the Ephesians chapter 18, Ignatius quotes 1 Corinthians 1.20, he states, Where is the wise man? Where is the disputer? Where is the boasting of those who are styled prudent? For our God, Jesus Christ, was, according to the appointment of God, conceived in the womb by Mary, of the seed of David, but by the Holy Ghost. He was born and baptized, that by his passion he might purify the water." Unquote. 1 Corinthians 1.20 states, Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Unquote. In Ignatius's letter to the Magnesians, chapter 11, he quotes 1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1. he states, Jesus Christ, who is our hope, from which may no one of you ever be turned aside, unquote. 1 Timothy 1.1 1, 1 states, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by command of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope, unquote. In Ignatius's letter to Polycarp, chapter 5, he quotes Ephesians 5.20, he states, in like manner also exhort my brethren in the name of Jesus Christ, that they love their wives, even as the Lord loved the church." Unquote. Ephesians 5.25 states, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Unquote. In the same letter to Polycarp, chapter 1, Ignatius quotes 1 Thessalonians 5.17. He states, Give yourself to prayer without ceasing. Unquote. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 states, Pray without ceasing." Unquote. We know that Ignatius was fed to lions in a Roman Colosseum for his faith since Christianity was being persecuted by the Roman state. This shows that Ignatius so firmly believed in his theology, which included Paul as a true apostle with inspired doctrine, that he was willing to be martyred for it. The fact that Ignatius was willing to die for his faith in theology, which included Paul as an inspired apostle, comes to us from various early texts. Chapter 5 of his Epistle to the Romans ironically is titled, quote, I Desire to Die. Unquote. In the early document known as the Martyrdom of Ignatius, chapter 6, we read, quote, Then being immediately thrown in, according to the command of Caesar given some time ago, he was thus cast to the wild beasts close beside the temple. Unquote. The 3rd to 4th century church historian Eusebius also mentions Ignatius's martyrdom. Quote, Reports say, that he was sent from Syria to Rome and became food for wild beasts on account of his testimony to Christ." Unquote. If Ignatius knew that Paul was an imposter or deceiver, he would not be willing to be martyred for his faith. As the saying goes, liars make poor martyrs. If he wasn't absolutely sure that Paul was a genuine apostle, he would not be willing to die for a faith or theology which included Paul as a true apostle. Hence, the conspiracy hypothesis won't work nor will the lack of certainty hypothesis. It is absurd to say that early fathers like this were in on some conspiracy to introduce Paul to people, while supposedly knowing that he was an imposter. The only way to get around the evidence would be to discard the evidence, which is extremely irresponsible.
or to assert that Ignatius was misled or deceived to accept Paul. But that doesn't work either, because Ignatius was very familiar with the theology of John and the other apostles, other apostolic texts, as well as Jesus' teachings in the Gospels. So if Paul was teaching something contrary to the apostolic first century message and was not accepted by the original apostles, Ignatius would not have supported Paul the way he did. Ignatius gives no indication that there were any early disputes amongst the first century Christians about Paul's reliability. Clement of Rome. Clement of Rome was a first century Christian secretary of the Church of Rome, responsible for correspondence with other churches. There is also evidence to suggest that he was a prominent presbyter of the Roman Church. Some believe he was the fellow worker Paul mentions in Philippians 4.3. In his letter, the first epistle of Clement, also known as the first epistle to the Corinthians, written in AD 96, Clement states the following about Paul, quote, Owing to envy, Paul also obtained the reward of patient endurance after being seven times thrown into captivity, compelled to flee and stoned. After preaching both in the East and the West, he gained the illustrious reputation due to his faith, having taught righteousness to the whole world, and come to the extreme limit of the West and suffered martyrdom under the prefects. Thus he was removed from the world, and went into the holy place, having proved himself a striking example of patience." Unquote. Quote, Take up the epistle of the blessed apostle Paul. What did he write to you at the time when the gospel first began to be preached? Truly, under the inspiration of the Spirit, he wrote to you concerning himself and Cephas and Apollos, because even then parties had been formed among you." Unquote. Notice that Clement, in representing the beliefs of the first century church at Rome, grants Paul's reliability. He mentions Paul's labors for the gospel, his persecution for the faith, and his martyrdom. He states that Paul was a, quote, striking example of patience, end quote, or in other words, endurance. Notice also, in the second citation, that Clement attests to Paul's reliability, in that he calls him a, quote, blessed apostle, unquote, and takes Paul's epistle to the Corinthians as authoritative and valid with respect to gospel truth and states that Paul wrote this letter, quote, under the inspiration of the Spirit, unquote. This means that Clement, and subsequently those in the first century Church of Rome, believed Paul's letters to be inspired, God-breathed scripture, canon. We know that Clement followed the teachings of the Apostle Peter and honored him deeply. Clement states, quote, let us set before our eyes the illustrious apostles, Peter, through unrighteous envy, endured not one or two, but numerous labors, and when he had at length suffered martyrdom, departed to the place of glory due to him." Unquote. Therefore, why would Clement, who, being familiar with the original apostolic message of Peter and the other apostles, grant Paul's reliability if Paul was preaching something other than what Peter and the other apostles were preaching? Evidence for Clement's familiarity with the teachings of Peter and the other apostles comes from the fact that in his letter to the Corinthians, he quotes or alludes to numerous texts from Peter, the Gospels, and the Apostles. For example, in chapter 2, he appeals to 1 Peter 2.17. In chapter 11, he appeals to 2 Peter 2, 6 to 9. In chapter 24, he appeals to Luke 8.5. In chapter 27, he appeals to Matthew 24.35. In chapter 31, he appeals to James 2.21. He knew of and followed these apostolic texts and teachings, and so if Paul was opposed to them and was not accepted by the apostles, Clement would either expose Paul or not support him or both. Since Clement knew of Peter and his teaching, why would he affirm Paul if Paul was just some imposter? If Paul was not a genuine apostle with the true original gospel, then Clement, knowing the message of Peter and the original apostles, would have either exposed Paul as an imposter or pointed out his theological errors. There is no indication from Clement's pen that there were any first century disputes amongst the first century Christians about Paul's reliability. Polycarp of Smyrna. Polycarp was a first century bishop like Ignatius. He was also a student and pupil of the apostle John and the other apostles. We know this from his writings as well as his contemporary who knew him, Irenaeus. We also know this from Tertullian. Polycarp's contemporary, Irenaeus, makes mention of the fact that Polycarp was a pupil of John and a pupil of the Apostles, being appointed Bishop of the Church in Smyrna by the Apostles themselves. Irenaeus also mentions that Polycarp was martyred for the Christian faith. Irenaeus states, For while I was yet a boy, 
I saw you in Lower Asia with Polycarp, distinguishing yourself in the royal court, and endeavoring to gain his approbation, for I have a more vivid recollection of what occurred at that time than of recent events. Inasmuch as the experiences of childhood, keeping pace with the growth of the soul, become incorporated with it, so that I can even describe the place where the blessed Polycarp used to sit and discourse, his going out too, and his coming in, his general mode of life and personal appearance, together with the discourses which he delivered to the people, also how he would speak of his familiar intercourse with John, and with the rest of those who had seen the Lord, and how he would call their words to remembrance, whatsoever things he had heard from them, respecting the Lord, both with regard to his miracles and his teaching, Polycarp having thus received information from the eyewitnesses of the word of life, would recount them in all harmony with the scriptures." Unquote. And when the blessed Polycarp was sojourning in Rome in the time of Anicetus, although a slight controversy had arisen among them as to certain other points, they were at once well inclined towards each other with regard to the matter in hand, not willing that any quarrel should arise between them upon this head, for neither could Anicetus persuade Polycarp to forego the observance in his own way, inasmuch as these things had been always so observed by John the disciple of our Lord, and by other apostles, with whom he had been conversant. Nor, on the other hand, could Polycarp succeed in persuading Anicetus to keep the observance in his way, for he maintained that he was bound to adhere to the usage of the presbyters who preceded him. And in this state of affairs, they held fellowship with each other, and Anicetus conceded to Polycarp in the church the celebration of the Eucharist, by way of showing him respect, so that they parted in peace, one from the other, maintaining peace with the whole church, both those who did observe this custom, and those who did not." Unquote. Quote, but Polycarp also was not only instructed by the apostles, and conversed with many who had seen Christ, but was also, by apostles in Asia, appointed bishop of the church in Smyrna, whom I also saw in my early youth, for he tarried on earth a very long time, and when a very old man, gloriously and most nobly suffered martyrdom, departed this life, having always taught the things which he had learned from the apostles, and which the church has handed down, and which alone are true." Unquote. In his epistle to the Philippians, Polycarp seems to indicate that he and his church were instructed directly by the apostles, quote, "...let us then serve him in fear, and with all reverence, even as he himself has commanded us, and as the apostles who preached the gospel unto us." Unquote. A second century document, written around AD 156, known as the Martyrdom of Polycarp, reported his brutal martyrdom, showing that he was willing to die for his faith in theology, which included Paul as a true apostle. A burning at the stake failed, and he was stabbed, quote, At length, when those wicked men perceived that his body could not be consumed by the fire, they commanded an executioner to go near and pierce him through with a dagger, unquote. Therefore, in light of all this early evidence which demonstrates that Polycarp knew the original apostles, knew their original first century gospel message, was appointed bishop of the church in Smyrna by the apostles, and suffered brutal martyrdom for his faith, it is indeed interesting that he would then affirm the apostle Paul as genuine and sound theologically if Paul was a false apostle. Polycarp states, quote, For neither I nor any such one can come up to the wisdom of the blessed and glorified Paul. He went among you accurately and steadfastly taught the word of truth in the presence of those who were alive then. And when absent from you, he wrote you a letter, which, if you carefully study, you will find to be the means of building you up in that faith which has been given you, and which, being followed by hope, and preceded by love towards God and Christ, and our neighbor, is the mother of us all." Unquote. Quote, I exhort you all, therefore, to yield obedience to righteousness, and to exercise all patience, such as you have seen set before your eyes, not only in the case of the blessed Ignatius, and Zosimus, and Rufus, but also in others among yourselves, and in Paul himself, and the rest of the apostles." Unquote. Quote, For if a man govern himself in such matters, how shall he enjoin them on others? If a man does not keep himself from covetousness, he shall be defiled by idolatry, and shall be judged as one of the heathen, 
But who of us are ignorant of the judgment of the Lord? Do we not know that the saints shall judge the world as Paul teaches? But I have neither seen nor heard of any such thing among you, in the midst of whom the blessed Paul labored, and who are commended in the beginning of his epistle, for he boasts of you in all those churches, which alone then knew the Lord. But we of Smyrna have not yet known him." Unquote. If Paul was an impostor, then Polycarp, knowing John and the other apostles, as well as their orthodox theology, would have spoken out against Paul. On the other hand, if someone asserts that Polycarp was a liar or conspirator, trying to mislead people to follow Paul for some nefarious, absurd reason, then Polycarp would not willingly go to his death for such a faith. This evidence is a fatal blow to the egregious falsehood of anti-Pauline critics. Polycarp also identified Paul's writings as sacred scripture, showing that Paul was viewed as an inspired apostle by Polycarp and those around him in the first century. For example, Polycarp says the following about Ephesians 4.26, quote, For I trust that you are well versed in the sacred scriptures, and that nothing is hid from you. But to me this privilege is not yet granted. It is declared then, in these scriptures, Be ye angry, and sin not, and let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Ephesians 4.26, It is germane to note that the early church writer Tertullian also relayed some pertinent information about Polycarp's status, he states. Quote, For this is the manner in which the apostolic churches transmit their registers, as the church of Smyrna, which records that Polycarp was placed therein by John." Unquote. This shows that it was widely known that Polycarp knew the original disciples. Therefore, the case is quite clear for Polycarp being a student of the original apostles. That the blessed Polycarp affirmed Paul's reliability is irrefutable. Frequent Gnostic claims to authority mean Paul is not reliable? One response Muslims have offered is that there were second century Gnostics like Valentinus, Montanus, Maximilla, and others who claimed to have authority or receive divine prophecy and revelation. Therefore, Muslims argue, since it was common for people to lie and claim to receive prophecy, authority, and revelation, one should not accept Paul. However, this is just the logical fallacy known as the problem of induction fallacy. Just because it is doubtful that the second century people had true apostolic authority and received visions and revelation, it doesn't therefore prove that Paul was false. That would be like me saying, because my cat is orange, therefore all cats must be orange. Secondly, this is a fallacious argument because such Gnostics are second century. Paul is first century. There are no meaningful, multiply attested first or early second century sources saying that these people or their followers knew the original apostles and were accepted by them. There is a wealth of multiply attested first and early second century evidence affirming that Paul and his followers knew the original apostles and were accepted by them. There is no meaningful first century evidence that Valentinus, Montanus, and Maximilla saw visions of the risen Lord. There is a wealth of first century evidence that Paul saw a vision of the risen Lord. There is no evidence whatsoever that Valentinus, Montanus, and Maximilla were willingly martyred for their faith. There is reliable first and early second century evidence that Paul and his followers were willingly martyred for their faith. Historians are interested in early multiply attested accounts. That is why Paul is reliable. To discard these historical principles, is to show incredible bias and demonstrate that one is not interested in what the earliest data says. In light of these facts, one cannot compare Paul to these later second century Gnostics, since the historical evidence is clearly in favor of Paul. Section 2, Critiquing the Muslim Misuse of the Ebionites. Are the Ebionites and their claims first century? Since it is clear that the first century case for Paul's apostleship is strong, Muslims have tried to find some kind of clear first century proof that would legitimately discredit Paul as a true apostle. Their main argument, or claim, is that an early sect called the Ebionites rejected Paul while claiming to have apostolic authority. It is true that this aberrant sect rejected Paul, and there is some evidence to suggest that they claimed to have apostolic authority, in that they believed their views were sanctioned by the Apostle James. 
However, what I will be demonstrating is that the Muslims are incorrect for dating this sect in their gospel slash beliefs to the first century. That the Ebionites were complete antichrist heretics, not only according to Christianity, but according to Islam. And finally, I will show that their absurd reason for denying Paul is not reliable historically. The original gospel of the Ebionites is lost, and we have no early works from any of their followers. What we do have is quotations of their gospel and refutations of their beliefs from a 4th century work known as the Panarion, which was written by the Christian writer Epiphanius of Salamis. It is agreed that the Ebionite gospel was a forged, mutilated document which quoted from Matthew, Luke, and Mark. In it are insertions and interpolations of their own narrations and beliefs as well. Various writers like the second century church father Irenaeus wrote on the Ebionites in his work Against Heresies, Book 1, Chapter 26, asserting that, quote, They practice circumcision, persevere in observance of those customs which are enjoined by the law, and are so Judaic in their lifestyle, unquote. The same source also affirms that they, quote, repudiate Apostle Paul, maintaining that he was an apostate from the law, unquote. However, Irenaeus does not indicate that the Ebionites go back to the first century. In his work, De Principis, Book 4, the early Christian writer Origen mentions the Ebionites and says that their name, Ebion, means poor. Origen also mentions them in his work Against Celsus. The 3rd to 4th century historian Eusebius also mentions them in his work Church History, etc. The, the Ebionite church dates back to the 2nd century. No, that, that's not true. It dates back to the 1st century. This is 1st century uh, documentation that we're looking at. Although Muslim apologists like Nadir Ahmed assert that the Ebionite testimony is 1st century testimony, scholars like Dr. Ron Cameron date the Gospel of the Ebionites to the mid-2nd century. In his work, The Other Gospels, Non-Canonical Gospel Texts, Dr. Cameron states, quote, The Gospel of the Ebionites was composed sometime after the Gospel of Matthew and Luke, and before the first reference to it in the writings of Irenaeus toward the end of the 2nd century. A date of composition in the middle of the 2nd century, when several other gospel harmonies were also being written, is most likely." Unquote. Cameron also notes that the Ebionites were, quote, a group of Greek-speaking Jewish Christians who were prominent throughout the 2nd and 3rd centuries, unquote. Dr. Jeffrey W. Bromley notes that the Ebionites were, quote, flourishing in the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th centuries AD, unquote. In the same work, Dr. Bromley also states that the Gospel of the Ebionites is second century. In his work, Apocryphal Gospels, in introduction, Dr. Hans Joseph Clock states that the Gospel of the Ebionites was, quote, composed most probably in the mid-second century, unquote. It must be stressed that it is widely acknowledged that there is no firm historical material proving that the Ebionite sect itself dates to the first century. Dr. Bart Ehrman has offered some speculation on this issue, however, because he feels that some of their beliefs are somewhat similar to those of the first century Galatians that Paul was in opposition to, that maybe the Ebionites are the physical and spiritual descendants of the Galatians. However, Ehrman doesn't attempt to trace such a line of descent with any meaningful historical evidence. One Muslim apologist, Sami Zatari, feels that this speculation from Ehrman is enough to prove that, quote, the Ebionites do have a foundation, even during the time of Paul, unquote. However, Ehrman himself is not even sure if there were Ebionites at the time when Paul disputed with the Galatians in the first century, since he says things like, quote, if these Christian Jews were in existence before the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70 AD, unquote. The fact is that there is just no real solid evidence tracing the Ebionite tribes to the first century. Scholarship holds that they emerged in the second century, and so therefore, their assertions about Paul not being a true apostle are merely late opinions far removed from the time of the apostles. The evidence shows that it wasn't until Paul was already dead when their fanciful distortions about him emerged. In fact, the earliest mention of their rejection of Paul comes from Irenaeus' second century work against heresies, and so therefore we have no evidence that their rejection of Paul wasn't just some second century novelty. Some people claim that the Ebionites can be traced back to first century Jerusalem because in Against Heresies, Book 1, Chapter 26, 
Irenaeus reports that, quote, they even adore Jerusalem as if it were the house of God, unquote. However, Sakari Hakinen states that the, quote, expression means the typical prayer orientation towards Jerusalem, and it cannot be used as evidence of the origins of the Ebionites in Jerusalem. As the Ebionites were committed to Jewish traditions, it was natural that they also prayed like Jews, unquote. In his detailed treatment on the subject, Dr. Joseph A. Fitzmaier sums up the current scholarly position saying, quote, there is simply no evidence for their existence in the first century AD, either before or after the destruction of Jerusalem, unquote. Damaging heresies of the Ebionites. The fact that the Ebionites were abominable heretics according to both Islamic and Orthodox Christian theology should make people question why Muslims use their late singular non-multiply attested testimony against Paul as evidence. Paul warned about potential heretics who would come and forbid the eating of meat and things of this nature. 1 Timothy 4, 1-3 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the later times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them, which believe and know the truth." Unquote. The Ebionites altered Mark 14, 12 to 15 in their second century gospel, the gospel of the Ebionites, to try to make Jesus a vegetarian, suiting their heretical practices. As Epiphanius notes, quote, and the Lord himself says, go ye into the city, and ye shall find a man bearing a pitcher of water, and ye shall follow whithersoever he goeth, and say ye to the good man of the house, where is the guest chamber, where I shall keep the Passover with my disciples, and he shall show you an upper room, furnished, there make ready. But the Lord says in return, with desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you. And he said, this Passover, not simply Passover, so that no one would practice it in accordance with his own notion. Passover, as I said, was roast meat and the rest, but of there, the Ebionites' own will, these people have lost sight of the consequence of the truth, and have altered the wording, which is evident to everyone from the sayings associated with it, and made the disciples say, Where wilt thou, we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And the Lord, if you please, says, Have I desired meat with desire? to eat this Passover with you?" Unquote. This severely damages the credibility of the Ebionites, showing that they were deceptive and dishonest in altering the text to suit vegetarianism. This gives further reason to question their claims about Paul as well. Moreover, in Origen's work against Celsus, he notes that there were different sects of Ebionites, many of which denied the virgin birth of Jesus. Origen mentions the quote, twofold sect of Ebionites, who either acknowledge with us that Jesus was born of a virgin, or deny this and maintain that he was begotten like other human beings." Unquote. This is heresy. Isaiah 7.14 predicts that, quote, The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Unquote. Luke 1, 32-35 also condemns the Ebionites, quote, He will be great, and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God." Unquote. The abominable Quran also condemns the Ebionites by admitting that Jesus had a virgin birth in Quran 19, 19-22 which states, He said, I am only a messenger of thy Lord, that I may bestow on thee a faultless son. She said, How can I have a son, when no mortal hath touched me? Neither have I been unchaste. He said, So it will be. Thy Lord saith, It is easy for me, and it will be that we may make of him a revelation for mankind, and a mercy from us. And it is a thing ordained, and she conceived him, and she withdrew with him to a far place." Unquote. The Ebionites held to numerous heresies about Jesus, including their claim that Jesus was the person of Adam, or a created spirit who was higher than the angels. Epiphanius states, quote, 
For some of them even say that Adam is Christ, the man who was formed first and infused with God's breath. But others among them say that Christ is from above, that he was created before all things, and that he is a spirit higher than the angels and ruler of all, that he is called Christ, and the world there is his portion. But he comes here when he chooses, and he came in Adam, and he appeared to the patriarchs with Adam's body on. And in the last days, the same Christ who had come to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob came and put on Adam's body, and he appeared to men, was crucified, rose, and ascended." Unquote. This type of apostasy is condemned in John 1, 1-3, which affirms that Jesus is the incarnate God when it states, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made." Unquote. See also Philippians 2, 6-11. This Ebionite heresy is also condemned by Islamic teaching. Quran 575 asserts that Jesus was just a human messenger, like those who passed away before Him, not Adam or a pre-existent exalted spirit. Quote, the Messiah son of Mary was no other than a messenger, messengers the like of whom had passed away before him. Lastly, a Muslim writer named Abdullah Smith claims that the Ebionites, quote, did not believe Jesus was God or the Son of God, unquote. However, historians realize that the Ebionites did believe Jesus was the adopted Son of God, a heresy according to both Christianity and Islam. The Gospel of the Ebionites alludes to the baptism of Jesus saying, quote, a voice sounded from heaven that said, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased, I have this day begotten you." Unquote. They took this and affirmed a form of adoptionism. According to Christianity, Jesus is the eternal divine Son of God, bearing the nature of God. See Proverbs 33 and 4, Isaiah 9, 6, and 1 John 5, 20. Not the adopted Son of God. And according to Islam, Jesus is not the Son of God in any sense. See Surah 6, 101 and Surah 112, 1 to 4. Therefore, one must question the integrity of any Muslim who would appeal to these Antichrist heretics for reliable information on Paul. These second century apostates are unreliable heretics according to both Islam and Christianity, and therefore the Muslim apologists ought to stop appealing to them and their late opinions as if they somehow represented early Orthodox Christian belief. They clearly did not. The Absurd Ebionite Charge Against Paul One would expect some kind of meaningful, widely acknowledged reason as to why the Ebionites would reject Paul in light of all of the early evidence proving that he was reliable. However, the reason given to us by the Ebionites as to why they asserted that Paul was not a true apostle is so absurd and outlandish that it makes me question why any Muslim would appeal to their late opinions as an argument. Epiphanius, writing in the 4th century, reports the following Ebionite charge, quote, The Ebionites declare that he, Paul, was a Greek. He went up to Jerusalem, they say, and when he had spent some time there, he was seized with a passion to marry the daughter of the priest. For this reason he became a proselyte, and was circumcised. Then, when he failed to get the girl, he flew into a rage, and wrote against circumcision, and against the Sabbath and the law." Unquote. Obviously this is a late concocted fable. It is quite remarkable that this is the basis for their bold rejection of Paul. This absurd charge reported in the 4th century by Epiphanius comes from an earlier lost Ebionite source called the Ascents of James. However, this source, which is the original source that this Ebionite fable comes from, is neither early nor reliable. Dr. George Strecker and Dr. Robert Van Voorst date this document to AD 150 to 200 and affirm that it was written in Pella in Transjordan. In their work, the brother of Jesus, James the Just and his mission, Bruce Chilton and Jacob Neusner, note that this is the quote, consensus view on the date and place of origin of the ascents, unquote. Therefore, this charge against Paul is not reliable historically and thus we have great reason to question the Ebionite claims about Paul. This Pauline fable is not multiply attested by any other source in the first or second centuries. Therefore, this charge against Paul 
not only fails the historical test of early accounts and early eyewitness testimony, but it also fails the test of multiple independent attestation. The first century evidence that I discussed earlier flies in the face of this absurd claim as well, rendering it impossible, since the orthodox, evidenced view has Paul as a true apostle and martyr for the faith. Based on the nature of this fanciful charge, it seems that the Ebionites were hard pressed for any real convincing evidence or argumentation against Paul's reliability. And so after Paul was dead, and not able to defend himself, the Ebionites invented this story to justify their heresies and their rejection of Paul's first century apostolic teachings of grace and faith. There is no evidence to suggest that this kind of anti-Pauline Ebionite thinking was part of any major strand of early first century Christian teaching, none whatsoever. There is a wide and broad scholarly view for this Ebionite charge against Paul being a later fabricated legend story or development, as opposed to historical reality. John Gager states that the Ebionites, quote, developed a legend to explain Paul's opposition to the law, unquote. Bruce Chilton and Jacob Neusner state, quote, Epiphanius reports a legend among the Ebionites that Paul accepted circumcision in the first place only to marry the daughter of the high priest, unquote. AFJ Cligen and G.J. Reinink identify this Ebionite charge as a quote, story, unquote. In reference to this specific Ebionite charge, Harold W. Attridge states, quote, another category of legends pertains to stories that characterize various aspects of an apostle's character. Christians opposed to Paul told the following story, unquote. Commenting on this charge, Matthew A. Jackson McCabe states, quote, Epiphanius transmits some new, fictitious stories that illustrate the Ebionites' anti-Paulinism. For instance, the Ebionites explain that Paul's antipathy toward the law and circumcision was caused by his unfortunate love affairs." Unquote. Richard N. Longnecker states that this Ebionite charge is one in a, quote, cycle of stories fostered in Ebionite circles of the late 2nd and early 3rd centuries, unquote. Section 3 early Muslim sources affirming the apostleship of Paul. In this section I will seek to demonstrate that modern Muslims are in error for rejecting the apostle Paul, since there are major strands of early Islamic tradition that grant Paul's reliability. Let us first turn our attention to the Quran itself. Many are unaware that the Quran gives an indirect argument for Paul's reliability. Surah 355 states, Behold, Allah said, O Jesus, I will take thee and raise thee to myself and clear thee of falsehoods of those who blaspheme. I will make those who follow thee superior to those who reject faith to the day of resurrection. Then shall ye all return unto me, and I will judge between you of the matters wherein ye dispute." Unquote. Surah 61, Ayah 14, quote, O ye who believe, be ye helpers of Allah. As said Jesus the son of Mary to the disciples, who will be my helpers to the work of Allah. Said the disciples, we are Allah's helpers. Then a portion of the children of Israel believed, and a portion disbelieved. But we gave power to those who believed against their enemies, and they became the ones that prevailed." Unquote. Here the Quran demonstrates that Paul was a true apostle, as well as a true follower of Jesus Christ, since these two texts state that the true followers of Jesus will be superior until the day of resurrection and that the true early Israelites who follow Jesus would be given power against their enemies and prevail over all other beliefs. However, we know historically that the followers of Jesus who prevailed and who were superior were those who followed apostles like Paul along with the rest of the 12 apostles. This means that Paul's message was the true message since it became dominant and prevailed along with the Christians who affirmed it. Muslim apologist Nadir Ahmed demonstrates the point and unknowingly proves that Paul is a true apostle, and that his followers were correct according to the Quran. Quote, to make a long story short, Paul's church eventually beat out its competitors and arose as the sole victorious church which is present today. Unquote. Moreover, the Quran nowhere mentions the apostle Paul by name or condemns him by name. Muhammad's ignorance of the first century may explain why this is so. But for the sake of argument, I would pose the following question to the Muslims who believe that Allah is the author of the Quran. If Paul was a false apostle and major corrupter of early Christianity, 
then why didn't Allah mention this explicitly and warn people about Paul, or inform Muslims about how he supposedly corrupted Christianity? I contend that this is a later development. In fact, it seems that the Quran had absolutely no knowledge of these issues. In my debate with the Muslim apologist Nadir Ahmed, he posed a response to the previous argument without actually dealing with the substance of Surah 355 and 6114. He argued that Muhammad taught that there was no prophet between Jesus and Muhammad, and since Paul fits the description of prophet, Islam therefore rejects Paul indirectly. Sahih Muslim, Book 30, Number 5834 states, quote, Abu Huraira reported Allah's messenger, may peace be upon him, as saying, I am most akin to the son of Mary, among the whole mankind, and the prophets are of different mothers, but of one religion, and no prophet was raised between me and him, Jesus Christ." Unquote. However, all this shows is that the Islamic sources contradict themselves, nothing more. On the one hand, the Quran affirms Paul's reliability indirectly. On the other hand, the Hadith rejects him indirectly. All this does is show a contradiction in the Islamic sources that Muslims need to reconcile. It doesn't refute the fact that the Quran indirectly affirms Paul's reliability. Moreover, although Paul had the characteristics of a prophet, Christians didn't really view him in the same category as Moses or Isaiah, but instead viewed him in the category of apostles like Peter or James. And so it is highly unlikely that this Hadith in Sahih Muslim even had Paul in mind. If this narration amounts to a rejection of Paul, then it likewise rejects Peter and John and all of the apostles of Jesus. Suddenly we are left with no apostles at all. Clearly the context of this Hadith in Sahih Muslim has nothing to do with Paul whatsoever. Commenting on Surah 6114, the respected Islamic commentator al qutbi grants the apostleship of Paul, quote, it was said that this verse was revealed about the apostles of Jesus, may peace and blessings be upon him. Ibn Ishaq stated that of the apostles and disciples that Jesus sent to preach, there were Peter and Paul who went to Rome, Andrew and Matthew who went to the land of the cannibals, Thomas who went to Babel in the eastern lands, etc. Notice that this ancient Muslim tradition has Paul as a true apostle. If Muhammad and the early Muslims taught that it was a priority to view Paul as a false usurper whose teachings were to be avoided, then we would not expect to find these ancient Muslim traditions which grant Paul's reliability. If it were a clear Muslim doctrine in the 7th and 8th centuries to reject Paul as the corrupter of Christianity, then one would not expect to find comments like this from al qurtubi and Ibn Ishaq. In a separate work, The Life of Muhammad, the 8th century Muslim historian Ibn Ishaq reports a tradition informing us about a popular Muslim view of Paul, quote, Those whom Jesus son of Mary sent, both disciples and those who came after them, in the land were Peter the disciple and Paul with him. Paul belonged to the followers and was not a disciple to Rome, Andrew and Matthew to the land of the cannibals, etc. Similarly, the 9th century Islamic exegete and historian Al-Tabari has this to say of Paul, quote, among the apostles and the followers who came after them were the apostle Peter and Paul who was a follower and not an apostle. They went to Rome." Unquote. Brother Sam Shimon has offered a detailed discussion on the subject of early Islam's view of Paul, wherein he states that with respect to this kind of identification of Paul as a follower and not a disciple, that this is in no way meant to discredit Paul or defame him. Shimon notes that the translator of Al-Tabari's history, Moshe Perlman, comments on this saying that, quote, in Islamic terms, the messengers or apostles paved the new path. Their work is continued by the tabi'un, the followers, members of the next generations who lead the faithful, unquote. Therefore, by identifying Paul as a follower and not an apostle, this has nothing to do with questioning Paul's status or reliability. It has to do with his sequential chronology. It is very interesting that although later generations of Muslims are quick to attack the Apostle Paul, the historical evidence shows that there was an early strand of Islamic tradition reported by some of Islam's greatest sources granting the reliability of the Apostle Paul. al tabari also states that Paul was martyred for his faith, which further shows his credibility as well as early Islam's support of Paul and Jesus' apostles. Quote, Abu Jafar says, they assert that after Tiberius, Palestine and other parts of Syria were ruled by Gaius, son of Tiberius, 
for four years. He was succeeded by another son, Claudius, for 14 years, following which Nero ruled for 14 years. He slew Peter and crucified Paul head down for four months, but Laius, Vitilius, ruled thereafter." Unquote. What must be stressed about all of this data is that if the Orthodox Muslim understanding at that time was an emphatic recognition that Paul was a usurper or corrupter, we simply would not see references like this about Paul being an apostle or follower of Jesus. These writings demonstrate that the anti-Pauline sentiment we see from Muslims today is not based on any clear teaching of Muhammad or early Islam. It is the product of a process of development in trying to solve the problem as to why Christianity is different than Islam. For further reading on the issue of early Islam's view on Paul, as well as a comparison between Paul's theology and Jesus' theology, proving that they taught the same things, see the following articles. Conclusion In this presentation, we have seen that the first century biblical data on Paul is unanimous and clear. We saw that it contains pertinent information which historians find persuasive in demonstrating that Paul was reliable. We saw that the early extra-biblical testimony from those who knew the apostles or who were familiar with their views and writings affirmed Paul's reliability. We saw that these early martyrs truly believed in their theology, which included Paul as a true apostle, and were willing to die for that belief. We saw that the early Muslim utilization of the Ebionites' testimony as an argument is hopelessly fallacious in light of the evidence and the consensus of scholarship, which shows that the Ebionites, their gospel, and their beliefs are unreliable and second century, not first century. We saw that the Ebionites were unreliable deceptive heretics, according to both Islamic and Christian theology, who even altered the gospel of Mark to suit their heretical views. We saw that they held the numerous damnable heresies, we saw that their rejection of Paul is not reliable in that they invented second century fables about him that have no basis in reality. We saw that serious scholarship is clear in rejecting their testimony and placing them in their material in the second century. And lastly, we saw that there is a very early strand of Islamic tradition that grants the validity of the Apostle Paul. I honestly feel that the Muslim has absolutely no historical basis for rejecting Paul's apostleship but that they are forced to do so because of sustainability and philosophical or faith reasons. Christ has risen, he is Lord.